Well, you can join me by opening your Bibles to the letter of First Peter. Um, and as you're uh, turning there, I um, want to just make a note. You all received a handout as you uh, came in this morning on how we should engage in politics as uh, Christians. If you didn't get that, you can probably get it on the Welcome Center, uh, Welcome Table um, on your way out. Um, and the reason for giving this is because uh, Christians uh, can tend to make either too much or too little of politics. Right? Some Christians can make it an ultimate thing. Um, others, though, can react to that and say, you know, politics shouldn't be idolatry, you know, right or left can't save us, and then they become passive and they view it as unimportant and they're totally disengaged. Um, but politics is an important way that we as Christians live out our faith and love our neighbors. So I'm not going to preach a sermon on uh, how to vote on the election, um, and I don't do that, but uh, if you've been here over time, you do know what we believe the Bible teaches about important issues that matter for this election, um, and we address them as they come up in our exposition of Scripture. So our MO is not to do topical sermons typically, but work through books of the Bible and address the things um, that come up. And so the handout that you have is a vision for how to engage in politics um, as a Christian, um, and so I'll also be handling, handing out a booklet um, next Sunday um, as well. So the next couple Sundays, a couple resources to help you as Christians uh, think about how to engage as a Christian um, in politics and how to think about uh, voting and so forth. Also, I wanted to let you know that some members will be meeting uh, to pray about our nation and about the upcoming election. Um, Elizabeth Nishala will be facilitating uh, this time with one of our elders. So if you would like to pray with other people from our church family about this, please join them next Sunday and then two Sundays from them then. So uh, November 2nd um, at 9 a.m., they'll meet in the prayer and gathering room, which is the room to the back over in that uh, direction. So now as we turn our attention to uh, 1 Peter, um, let's, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word that you give us, and we thank you that you speak clearly, and you, uh, your word is, as you yourself say in your word, living and active and powerful. And so by the power of the Spirit, would you take these words and let them have a transformative effect in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, many people are uh, waking up to how we are deeply affected as human beings, by the food we eat. What we put into our bodies affects how we feel, how we think. Um, if we put unsubstantial or harmful foods in our bodies, it has a negative effect in our body. But when we eat healthy food, we get nourished, we have energy, our immune system is strengthened, we think more clearly. Now, what if there is a connection like this with our spiritual diet? We take in spiritual food, and we're nourished to think, to feel, to live differently. What if a Christian's spiritual health issues, tied to that mental and emotional health issues, and even connected to that some physical issues, what if that can actually be traced back to spiritual nutrition or malnutrition? What if a, a local church's disunity or unhealthiness can be traced back to a lack of spiritual nutrition. Well, our text this morning, 1 Peter 1, verses 22 to 2, 3, answers this question. Peter says that the health of a Christian and the health of a local church is dependent on their spiritual intake. So what we eat and drink spiritually matters. So it is, our health is dependent on how much you take in of the full, true, life-transforming, powerful message of the gospel of Jesus and his word. Peter gives us a vision then for what a healthy church should look like, what a healthy Christian life should look like. A Christian's life is marked by love. That should be no surprise. Love is central in our world. Love is central in the Bible. Uh, but the way that Peter defines it is he shows that this is far more than what we often think of. It is a sincere earnest, relationally connected love. A healthy church is marked by relationships of love among the members. And Peter shows us how we actually grow in this, how we actually accomplish this. He shows us how a church can cultivate a culture of love. And it shows us that how God himself is the one who does this, 
We can't do this ourselves. God does it, but He does it through particular means. He does it through His Word. In other words, He doesn't do it through the leadership thinking through what fads are working at various churches and various cultures. He doesn't do it through our ingenuity and our wisdom and thinking through how to manipulate an environment to make people feel emotionally different. He does it through His Word, which is why we want the Word to be central. So, Pete, I want to show this from this um, letter here and from our text in particular. So, the main question of this text is this. How do we grow together in a life of love? And the answer is through continually, right, us individually and all together, continually receiving, right, drinking in and eating spiritually the Word of Christ, the gospel of Jesus is what grows us in a life of love. It's the spiritual nutrition that makes us grow. So let's read now 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22 through 23. It says this, "...having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart." Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. So, put away all malice, and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The gospel of Jesus Christ in all of Scripture is what grows us in a life of love. So Peter answers a few key questions about this life of love. What does it look like? What does this life of love look like? Why should we care about it? How is this even possible? How can it grow in us? So we'll answer those questions as we go. So what we'll see here is the sincerity of love, the reason for love, the possibility of love, and the growth of love. So first, the sincerity of love. The first command of this text is right here at the beginning in verse 22. Love one another. Not complicated. Peter then fills out what this love looks like. So notice he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So this is a uniquely Christian love. It's a brotherly love that we have for one another as Christians. The Bible is, of course, filled with the call for Christians to love everybody. But there is a distinct love that Christians are to have for one another. And Christians live out this life of love in their relationships with other Christians and centrally in the local church. This is why Peter calls this a brotherly love. It's the kind of love that's among family members and the church is a new family of brothers and and sisters. It's the kind of love we have for the closest friends. He also says that this love is a sincere love. This means it's genuine. It's not fake. It's not a pretending kind of love. So let's be honest, a lot of the love that we can show people uh, can often not be deeply genuine. We kind of generally love certain people, we're okay with them, we treat them well enough, and we can fake our way through it with a lot of people, can't we? As long as it's a quick interaction, as long as they don't bother us, as long as it's not costly for us, but if they cut us off in traffic, if they smell bad and we find them annoying, if they're a bit rude to us, then our love becomes a bit of pretending until we can get out of there. But Peter is calling us to have a sincere, genuine, brotherly love for one another. It's also an earnest love. He doesn't say love one another moderately. He doesn't say love one another theoretically or generally. A lot of people love the world. A lot of people want to change the world. A lot of people love everyone, but they can't get along with anyone. This is an earnest love. Now, what would be the opposite? 
of this kind of brotherly, sincere, earnest love. Well, Peter shows us a few verses later in chapter 2, verse 1. He lists five anti-love qualities that damage relationships. These attitudes kill an atmosphere of love in relationships, kill an atmosphere of love in a home, kill an atmosphere of love in church. The first is malice, bad or evil behavior toward others. The next is deceit, which is speaking untruthfully to others. The third is hypocrisy. So this is hiding who you really are so people think differently about you or better about you. It's pretending to be one way on Sunday mornings here while your family knows who you really are at home. That's a hypocritical love. The fourth is envy. Envy is resenting somebody for some advantage or privilege they have. You wish they didn't have it and you wish you did. So you resent someone for the role that they have or their skill, or their reputation. The last is slander. This is speech that disparages someone and diminishes their reputation. This uh, certainly can involve spreading things that aren't true, but it can also be unnecessarily spreading things that uh, are true. So it can be things that are not true or true. It can involve framing something in a way that diminishes people's view of a person. So, in other words, this could involve just insinuating something negative about somebody. Framing something in a way that distorts the full picture so that you can diminish someone's reputation in the minds of other people. Very common in social media now. It's becoming increasingly common in our political discourse Uh, which is no longer just reserved to certain realms, but the conversation of so many people. We see it in those whose platform, or, you know, what some people call like watch bloggers, these, these watchdog platforms that are about reporting every misdeed of every public figure. They often spread information that is not fully verified and is distorted and filled with little insinuations of wrongdoing. Peter says, Christian... You are called to love one another, and that means all of that has to go. No malice, no deceit, no hypocrisy, no envy, no slander. This is the sincerity of love. Of course, we will not be able to do this perfectly, but we are called to pursue this truly. But why? Why does this matter for Christians? This is what we see next. So second, the reason for love. Christians love like this because it's one of the very purposes of our salvation. Peter makes that point in this verse, in verse 22. He wrote, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. So we have been purified for the purpose of this kind of love. What does it mean to have our souls purified by obedience to the truth? Well, this is Peter's way of saying that we have a renewed heart through receiving the gospel. When Peter says we've obeyed the truth, it's another way of saying we believed the gospel. It's the truth, the message of Jesus that comes to us, and we obey it by trusting Jesus and following him. It's our embrace of this message. And Peter says when you do that, when you become a Christian through believing the message, obeying the truth, your soul is purified. You are renewed and washed and transformed. And what's the purpose of that purification? Peter says your souls were purified for this purpose, for a sincere brotherly love. So if you are a Christian, why do you think God saved you? What was the point? Do you know that one of the central reasons is so that you could get in relationships with other Christians, be part of a local church, and be contributing to a culture of sincere love. God's purpose is not just to go around saving individuals and giving them forgiveness of sins, though that's included and centrally important. His purpose is also to transform us to love one another. So are you treating the local church like a drive through fast food window? Right? If so, then you're missing the purpose of, the win- of salvation, just kind of pulling in and pulling out. The very purpose of your salvation is that you would be part of a community of sincere love. This is why our church exists. This is why the local church is central to God's purposes. This is why we don't just emphasize the Sunday morning gathering, but also friendship 
and small groups. It's why we don't just embrace gospel doctrine, but we cultivate a gospel culture of love. Now, at this point, we may be asking, but how is this actually possible? If we actually keep the bar as high as Peter is setting it, we recognize that this is hard to find in the world. This is hard to do. So, now we see it's a central purpose of our salvation. So, how is this accomplished? How can you and I actually cultivate this? That's what we see next. So, third, the possibility of love. When someone becomes a Christian, far more happens than that they just believe Jesus and trust him. What happens is what Peter calls being born again. This is how we can actually obey this love command. Notice he gives the command in verse 22, and then do you see what he says next in verse 23 and what that verse begins with? Since. He's giving the reason here. So notice what he says. Love one another since you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So here's the logic. Love one another because you have been born again. So the new birth, being born again, that's what gives us a new power and new energy to actually love. So what does it mean to be born again? Well, some people, maybe you've heard it expressed this way, some people think a born again Christian is just a a certain kind of Christian. So there's these Christians, there's those Christians, there's those born-again Christians. But really, there's no other kind of Christian. You are either born again or you are not a Christian. Being born again is something Jesus and the rest of the New Testament teach. Jesus, here's a few examples to show how pervasive this is. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you're born once, But there's a second birth, a new birth that you need to experience or you can't even see and enter the kingdom of God. And no doubt, I mean, Peter's drawing this from the Old Testament, Ezekiel, so this is from the Old Testament. But then the rest of the New Testament disciples and authors learned this from Jesus and say the same thing. So Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He talks about us being made alive together with Christ. James said, of his own will, God brought us forth by the word of truth. So this is not uh, our initial creation and birth. This is new birth. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures or of his new creation. Peter already said in his letter, according to his great mercy, He, God, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then John wrote, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, right? So there's a a change that happens. If you're born of God, you don't make a practice of sinning again. That doesn't mean you won't sin again. You don't make it a practice because you're new, you're changed. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep sinning because he's been born of God. If you've experienced the new birth, it is impossible for you to go on living a life entrenched in sin. There is a break that happens. And if it's not happened, you've not yet been born again. The new birth, what uh, theologians call regeneration, is necessary. It's true of every Christian. So if you've not experienced this, you're not yet a real Christian. So what is the new birth like, and how does it actually bring about this change? How does it empower us to fulfill this love command? Well, Peter uses a striking image here. He uses the image of a seed to explain this. Now, seeds, if if you had one in your hand right now, you'd look at it, and it does not seem very impressive. It does not look very powerful. You know, why couldn't Peter talk about something bigger, like, I guess he wasn't thinking of nuclear bombs at that time, but just some big explosive reality, right? Why can't you think, like, it's like a, a lightning bolt, right? Why is the new birth described that way? It's a seed. Well, listen to him explain. He says that God's word is like a seed that causes us to be born again. Notice he says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Okay, so there's a kind of seed that's imperishable. And then he clarifies, through the living and abiding word of God. So think of gardening and the power of a seed. You start the season with a dry, dead, flat plot of soil, 
And then you put these little seeds in the ground, and they have the power of life in them. Sun, water, nutrients from the soil, then it grows. The plants rise. Then you have leaves and fruit and vegetables. Seeds are so powerful that some of them, if they're under concrete, they can still break through the concrete. Christine and I were taking a walk last night, and we saw a house that looks like it hasn't been kept up well the past few years. And you can see how just the, the fallen creation is starting to overtake the driveway and the, and, and the house. Give it a few more years, and trees will be growing, bursting through the driveway and breaking that house down. That happens. That's what the new birth is like. Peter said the seed is planted in you. So it may not feel revolutionary to you immediately, but that new power is there and it starts growing and you start to change. He says the seed is the word of God, the gospel. It's the message of salvation for sinners through Jesus. We hear this message. It comes to us like a seed. Jesus taught that as well. And then it gets planted in us and transforms us. And notice he says that we are born again through this seed, through, by means of, the living and abiding Word of God. So it's the Word of God that causes the new birth. Peter next quotes Isaiah 40, which says, All flesh is like grass, its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord, right, this imperishable seed, remains forever. And then he says this enduring Word is the message of the gospel of Jesus. And the point here is that it's through this message that God gives us the new birth. We're born again through the seed, through the word, through the message. So the gospel is a message of words, and it comes to us with a call. The call to trust, to repent and believe. That's what we call the general gospel call. It's the call to believe in Jesus and his death and resurrection for your salvation. That call comes to everyone who hears the message of the gospel, which is why we call it the general call. It's a general call that goes to all in the hearing of the gospel. But what Peter refers to here is what is referred to in theology as the effectual call. So the effectual call happens when God takes that general gospel call that comes to people and he makes it effective, which is why it's called the effectual call. He takes the gospel that you hear and it hits It may come to you over and over and nothing happens. Comes to a lot of people, nothing happens. But then God makes it effective for you and causes you to be born again through it. He opens your heart to receive it. And it's through the effective call as we hear the gospel that God causes us to be born again. So if you're a Christian, think about your story. Think about when you became a Christian or the fact that you are one now. You became a Christian when two things happened. Number one, you were exposed to the message of the gospel. The general call, gospel call came to you. Maybe your parents taught it through you, taught it to you over years. Maybe you got a Bible and read it. Maybe a friend shared it with you. Maybe you went to youth group and heard it. Maybe you attended a church service and heard it. Uh, You heard the essential message of the gospel. And if you're not yet a Christian, this is what that message is at the heart of it. It is the message that God made you and placed you in this world, and he loves you. And you and I have all turned away from him. And we loved all his gifts and all all this world he's made more than we love him. And so we embrace all these good gifts, and we love ourselves more than him. And so we live for ourselves, and we deserve eternal death for this. But because God is love, and he delights to show mercy to sinners and rebels, He set out on a rescue mission. And so he sent Jesus to come live the life that we've now failed to live, the perfect life of trusting the Father and living a life of love, sincere brotherly love. And then he died the guilty hellish death that we deserve to die. And then he rose again in victory, conquering sin and death. And if you repent of your sins and trust in him, you will be saved. You will not experience eternal death. You will be forgiven. You'll be adopted into God's family. Christ will be yours forever to live with him in a new earth in the coming ages. So that's the the general call of the gospel. 
The second thing that happens, if you're a Christian, the second thing that happened to you is what we call the effectual call. God took that message, and at some point in time, he caused you to be born again through that message. He took that message, and by the power of the Spirit, he made it effective in your heart. You went from death to life, from unsaved to saved, from guilty to forgiven. Now, every time we talk about this, I remind us that we may not know exactly when this happened in our life. For some of you, you do know the exact moment. You know your first birth date, got it on your birth certificate, you know your second new birth date. Um, others of you, though, you don't know when it happened. You grew up in a Christian home, maybe. You seem to trust Christ from an early age. Or like me, it happened over the course, it or happened at some point in a year when I was about 11. Um, so if, if you... No, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. The point is, if you are trusting in Christ and you are saved, there was a moment. So just because you can't define the moment doesn't mean that moment didn't happen. The new birth is not gradual. It may feel that way to you, but it is a moment in time when that seed is planted in you. God knows when that was. It happens in an instant, and you know it happened Not because you felt it happen in that moment, maybe, but because you see the effects of it. You know that that a tree or a seed was planted somewhere because there's a tree there now, right? Maybe you don't know when that seed went in the ground, but you know that it did because look at that tree. Not complicated there. So think about your own life. You see the change. You're trusting Jesus wholeheartedly. You're following him. That only happens... If the new birth has happened, you don't know when the seed was planted in your heart and started to sprout, but you do know that it's growing because you see the fruit. Here's the point for us this morning in Peter's emphasis. This is the reason why sincere love is possible among Christians. This is why we believe a gospel culture of love in our church is possible. It's because of the new birth. It's because of the doctrine of the reality of regeneration. But if that makes love possible, how do we actually grow in it then? How do we become more loving in practice? How can our church become a brighter light of life and love? That's what we see next. So finally, the growth of love. This is what Peter focuses on at the beginning of chapter 2 now. We grow in love as we keep feeding on the spiritual nutrition of the gospel. So let's read this in verses 2 and 3. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it, by that spiritual milk, you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. So what is the pure spiritual milk here? Well, we may think in light of everything we've seen so far that it is God's Word, and that's not totally out of the picture, but I think Peter gets more focused than that. Yes, God's Word is our spiritual milk that causes us to grow. But notice what Peter says at the end here. He says to long for this milk, right, that's what we taste and that's what we drink, the spiritual nourishment. But then he says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, not if indeed you've tasted that the Bible is good. That would be fine. Bible talks that way. But Peter's focusing on the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus is the point of it all. Jesus is the point of the Bible. So what is the sustenance that causes you and I to grow? It's ultimately Jesus. Knowing him. It is, in a sense, tasting him with our soul. It's being nourished through communing with him, knowing him, delighting in him. Jesus is our nourishment. Jesus is our spiritual food. But of course, how do we access this spiritual food? Where do we get to know Jesus? Well, through God's word, and in particular, the gospel. That's what Peter's been talking about all along. It's God's Word that causes us to be born again, but especially the gospel message. The whole Bible is ultimately a gospel story anyway. 
It's ultimately a story of good news for people whose lives are bad news. It's a story that reveals Jesus to us and puts Him on display. If you read through the Bible and Jesus isn't becoming clear to you, you're reading the Bible wrong. Seeing Jesus in all of Scripture isn't a lens that we, we get added to Scripture or it's not a framework we impose on Scripture. It's how Scripture is actually presented to us. And so we learn about Jesus from the Bible. It's a story that reveals him to us and therefore causes our new birth and our growth. Here's how Ed Clowney put it. The word of the Lord constantly presents the Lord of the word. Or here's how Jesus himself put it, referring to the Old Testament. He said in John 5, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, in the Old Testament scriptures, you have life. And it's they that bear witness about me yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So according to Jesus, the Old Testament, we don't argue that the New Testament is about Jesus, but the Old Testament, he's saying that bears witness about me so that you can come to me and have life. Sounds a lot like Peter. Peter's saying the good news of Jesus and all the Bible, that's what gives you life. That's what gives you new birth. And that's what you keep feeding on for nourishment and growth. We grow through Jesus and his word He says, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. That itself is a summary of the new birth. With the new birth, we get a new spiritual taste bud for Jesus. Before you're a Christian, you do not taste and see the Lord is good. You learn about Jesus, might kind of like Jesus. You might like Christian community. You might be intrigued by the Bible. You might like the philosophy of Christianity. You might like how Christianity is kind of helpfully different than the crazy of our culture right now, but until you have spiritual taste buds to taste that he's good, then you're not yet a Christian. This is what it means to become one. So Jesus to our soul is like honey to our mouth. That's what happens in the new birth. It's what happens when you know you're born again. You've not, if you've not yet tasted Jesus is good, you're not truly born again. And Peter's point here is that's also the way you keep growing. You keep drinking. You keep being nourished by Jesus and his word. You keep enjoying him like honey to your soul. Now, some of you who have been Christians for a while may be thinking something at this point. If you've kind of read other parts of the New Testament, you may remember that the Bible, Paul and Hebrews, also use this image of spiritual milk. And you know that in those places, it gives this image of milk as only for what we could call newborn Christians. It says milk is for baby Christians, Meat is for spiritually mature Christians, adults, right? So you graduate from milk to meat, like babies grow from milk to meat. Yes, that's good. But Peter is using the image differently, and we need to embrace his point. Otherwise, we'll actually misunderstand what that other image of milk to meat is even talking about. Peter is saying that the whole of the Christian life, he is not just talking to baby Christians here, the whole of the Christian life is us taking the posture of an infant Drinking in the spiritual milk of Christ and his word. We never outgrow our dependence on Christ and his word and the gospel. We never move beyond or graduate from the gospel. We move deeper into it. So we never, seek, we never move beyond seeking to enjoy Jesus and his grace. So if your idea of the milk to meat thing is that milk is the gospel... Right? Christ and his death and resurrection for sinners and his, his soon return and repentance and faith and all of that. If that's your idea of milk, but then meat has to do with other deeper things disconnected from those things, uh, that you kind of leave the gospel to study other doctrines and things. Well, you're misunderstanding how growth works and you're actually misunderstanding the deepest nature of those topics and doctrines. We never move beyond the gospel Any deeper we go into the Christian faith is deeper into Jesus and the gospel. If Jesus and the gospel caused you to be born again, then that's what you grow, grow in. And if Jesus and the gospel is boring to you and you want something else, then whatever else else it is you're pursuing, that's not actually causing you to deeply grow because growth is connected with the word of Christ. So we never outgrow our dependence on him. Now, how do we cultivate this kind of growth very practically? Here's a few suggestions. Uh, First of all, keep the new birth central. 
So have you been born again? That is the most important question of your life. Through history, the times of renewal and revival in churches and areas and regions and continents often comes when two doctrines become laser-focused and crystal clear to people. One is the doctrine of the new birth. People assess, am I actually born again? And they realize that for many people, they go through the motions, they're good church people, they're nice people, they like reading the Bible, but they're not born again. The second doctrine is justification by faith alone. Focused clarity that we are saved not by being good and trying to be good Christians, but through Jesus and his goodness and his death for us. Salvation by faith alone. So keep that central. And for your own self, if you've not yet been born again, if you've not received the gospel into your soul, if you've not tasted that the Lord is good, you are not saved. You are not yet eternally safe in Jesus. And so this morning you can turn from your sin and receive his grace. Uh, parents among us, especially with children um, in the home, do you, well, I guess any children, do you pray for this for your children? Your goal is not just to keep them well-fed and clothed and smart. Um, the ultimate goal is to prepare them for eternal life, to see them born again. And your goal is not just to have them um, in kind of a superficial way make a decision or pray a prayer. Uh, many people do that for all sorts of mo motives when they're young and they're not actually born again. Uh, we were just talking about this as elders this past Monday. We were discussing the way many people talk to children about receiving Jesus into their hearts. Now, you can do that in a way that makes sense and has a framework of good theology and good motives, so no dismissing that. But that language of receiving Jesus into the heart is not a deeply biblical way of talking about things because coming to Christ is, is more about bowing before Jesus, trust, repenting of your sin and trusting him rather than receiving him into your heart, which can actually be confusing to a kid um, in, in a literalistic fashion, kind of opening the door of my heart, having Jesus live in there. Kids have talked about how they were very confused when they were little, thinking that that's what they were doing, and they don't yet understand the implications of this. So just talk biblically, robustly. Jesus said, repent and believe. Let's talk about that. What does it mean to repent and believe the good news of Jesus and follow him as our Lord? We're longing for new birth. We pray for new birth. Only the Lord can do it. So we bring the word there. We, we get the seed around. We keep throwing the seed in the dirt. And we say, Lord, let it take root. Parents have a lot of responsibilities to their children, but their greatest prayer, their greatest concern, their greatest hope should be, must be, for the Lord to give them new birth. And that's what happens through the word of the gospel. So we talk about Jesus. We pray for God to give the new heart. Second, focus your growth on Jesus and his word. So when you think about how to grow as a Christian, how to do this Christian life thing, focus on Jesus and his word. If a newborn is going to grow, what do they need? They need milk. If a Christian is going to grow, what does he or she need? Jesus and his word. So this means engaging God's word, always keeping Jesus and the gospel central. This involves reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible, memorizing the Bible as you do this, always seeking to let it reveal to you Jesus. So if you're a small group leader and you want to help your small group members grow, this is how you do it. You keep God's word and especially the, the point of God's word, which is Christ and his grace, central. You gather like children who need to be nourished by knowing and enjoying Jesus from the word. I often encourage people to study theology and read scripture-saturated books as you do this, always remember that in doing that, you are not leaving the gospel behind, but going deeper into it. The goal is not to puff yourself up with knowledge, but to humble yourself more before Jesus and to be nourished. Maybe you feel right now spiritually malnourished or spiritually lethargic. If you feel like that, it is because you are not being nourished by the spiritual milk. So how do you wake up? How do you gain strength? How do you grow? You drink from Christ and his word. A closed Bible Christian is like a malnourished baby who has a full bottle with the cap left on. Third, let your growth lead to love. This is the point. This is why you were saved. It's the goal of your growth. You are saved to reflect Jesus' love, becoming like him by living a life of love together. So as you engage God's word, 
And as you grow, don't view it as just an independent self-improvement project. Consider how what you read in God's Word, every time you read it, should lead you to repent of sin. Consider how it should change your behavior. Don't minimize God's expectations of your holiness or change in your life. He saved you to make you more like Jesus in a life of love. So even as you read the Bible, if Jesus is not that impressive to you and the gospel isn't a marvel to you, part of it could be that you're not growing in your own awareness of the depth of your sin. When sin is big to you, Jesus is bigger. That does not mean you should be sinning more. As you grow, you should be sinning less. But as you grow, you also grow low in humility And the sin that you have, even though it's less than it used to be, to your eyes is bigger to you than it used to be because you see it for the horror that it is in light of Jesus' perfect holiness and love. So humble yourself, repent of sin, and then be in awe again at Jesus. And then finally, let's cultivate a church where Jesus and his word is central. That's what we're doing. If we want a church with a culture of sincere love, which is the aim of Peter here, then this is the way to get it. Love is the result of being nourished by Christ and his word. This is why we keep Jesus and his word central in our singing, our praying, our preaching, our reading in the service here. This is why we emphasize the gospel all the time. This is why we don't want people to volunteer too much during the service so that they miss preaching too much. This is why we prioritize the gospel and God's word in our children's ministries. This is why we focus on global missions. It's to get the gospel toward people so the new birth can happen. And so we want a church family where the word is central because we are like spiritual children needing to be nourished by his word. And and what a gift that the Lord would order it this way. That we do not have to, in our own strength, try to figure this thing out. If you feel your need of him, If you feel a spiritual hunger for Jesus, that itself is a gift from God, and he meets it through Jesus. He satisfies you through Jesus. Uh, So let's keep Jesus central and enjoy him and grow up in him. And if you're still, if you're kind of wondering, I still don't know uh, what this looks like in life, there are a lot of people that you can get to know in this church, or maybe you already know if you've been here a while, who can help you with this. So talk to each other about what does it look like for you to grow in tasting and seeing that the Lord is, is good. How does this happen in your life? Or how has it happened for you when it was working well in your life? Um, or any ideas for how a, a next step I can do? Maybe talk about this as small groups, maybe after the service. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for revealing your glory in Jesus in the Scriptures. Thank you for giving us a feast in the Bible, an endless feast and a bottomless well of water and spiritual milk. We thank you for giving us the privilege of being a church family. We thank you for transforming us by the new birth and putting before our eyes other men and women and brothers and sisters in Christ here who reflect your glory in love. We pray that we would grow in this love and grow as believers. We pray that you would cultivate in us a longing for the spiritual milk of Christ and his word. And we pray that as we do this, we would become increasingly a bright light in the culture and to our neighbors and friends and coworkers and family members, and that they would be drawn to experience this new birth as well. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.